this year it is the 100 year anniversary of the formation of Mysteria Mystica Maxima, which is the British section of Order Templi Orientis. And even though the organizations which eventually turned into OTO as we know it um, have been had been kicking around for about 10 years before that, uh, it was really in 1912 that we really see the structure, again, that we recognize start to emerge. And so in many ways, 1912 is not only the centennial of um, Mysteria Mystica Maxima, but also of Order of Templi Orientis itself. And on this occasion, I did break this huge tome, Forgotten Templars. Um, it's a big, heavy book, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's chock full of pictures. It's uh, If it was a, just a normal, standardized paperback, it would probably be about 700 pages long. But I went with this oversized format because there's a lot of like certificates and things that are reproduced. And when you do that in a small format, it's almost not worth doing it. And I really wanted to tell our history in a uh, format that would be you know a, a good reference tool for the future. So this talk is going to kind of hit the highlights of the story in Forgotten Templars. To tell the tale of OTO and its emergence, we need to think of a or imagine a far off mythical land, Germany. And we also have to imagine the mythical peoples of Germany at this time. That's right, I'm talking hippies. <laughs> Sun worshipping, nature loving, clothes hating, women's liberating, commune living, vegetarian Aryan hippies. Uh, the, the late 1800s in Germany was the heyday of something called the Levens Reform Movement or the Life Reform Movement. And it was a, a move against the progressing industrialization of the West that has been going on. And people began embracing, again, a more natural and a simpler lifestyle. So you did have people becoming vegetarians, uh, going to simpler clothing, natural fibers. Uh, there, was a, there was a great deal of nudism as well, sun worshiping, and also a reclaiming of older folk traditions and folk religions, uh, which also is part of the Volkish movement, which was also happening at that same time. So you see the, the, this turn, turning away almost from modernity to been going back to older traditions. And if you had to pick one person as the poster child of this movement, it is the artist Fidus, or his mundane name, or uh, non-pen name, uh, was Hugo Hoffner. And here's just a couple examples of his artwork. It really exemplifies a lot of the, the ideas that were central to the Levin's Reform movement, the, the nudism, the nature reform, these you know, elaborate you know, natural temples, and so on. And his art actually wound up being an inspiration to the 1960s countercultural movement when this whole uh, you know, ethos kind of migrated across the ocean and took root in uh, the Haight-Ashbury district you know, generations later. So um, his work was very inspirational to them. And it's also very relevant to the talk that we're having today because uh, Fidus was also an illustrator for a lot of the occult journals of the day. So that's one piece of, of the story. The other piece of the of the background to really kind of appreciate where OTO came from is just is the the state of Freemasonry at this time. In the United States, for example, each state of the Union is governed by a Grand Lodge, and all of the Blue Lodge or you know the the Masonic bodies that confer the first three degrees, the basic degrees of Freemasonry, are all under the obedience of that Grand Lodge. Similarly, in Europe. All of the countries in Europe operate under the obedience of a single Grand Lodge. So in the so in England you have the United Grand Lodge of England. In France, you have the Grand Orient de France. But in Germany, this system breaks down and you have not one but eight. <laughs> and these Grand Lodges did not have like separate jurisdictions or geographical areas. They all had lodges that were opening in overlapping areas, so in any town you could actually have multiple lodges, each under the jurisdiction of a different Grand Lodge. And while these eight Grand Lodges banded together to form a, a Gross Logenbund, or a Union of Grand Lodges, you know, they occasionally had meetings to kind of discuss you know, some cooperation and things, but they didn't really merge or coalesce or cooperate in a lot of things. They're, the purpose seemed to be mostly to make sure that 
they they were kind of watching each other's backs so that there were no more Grand Lodges springing up. So they were kind of <laughs> agreeing to recognize each other just to kind of protect, you know, their, their bailiwick, as it were. That was the case, at least, until this fellow, Herman Setegast, came along. And he was actually the, the Grand Master of one of the Grand Lodges in Germany, and he was having a problem with it because... He, he was finding that contrary to the idea that Freemasonry is open to all men who profess a belief in a deity, doesn't matter what deity in particular, it could be of any faith, as long as you profess this uh, belief in a deity, they were eligible to be Freemasons. But in practice, this wasn't really happening. For one thing, he was finding that a lot of the lodges were very anti-Semitic, and if you came applying for membership, you would be blacklisted and not accepted as a member because of your faith. And the other thing that he found was that a lot of the Masonic rituals, even though they profess to be non-denominational, were really written in such ways they assumed that your faith was Christian. And he thought that these rituals needed to be revised to remove those overtly Christian elements. He, he made this recommendation to his Grand Lodge, and they politely ignored this uh, suggestion. And so he started his own Grand Lodge. And the result of that was a lawsuit. The, the Gross Logan Boone brought a lawsuit against Sedegas saying, you can't do that, we don't recognize you, and if you don't have one of us authorizing you to do this, you can't operate. This went to the Ger German courts, who in a landmark decision, essentially said, no, uh, so long as you operate according to the associational laws of Germany, which govern you know, any clubs and associations, you have a right to call yourself whatever you want. You know, just obey the law. And that kind of threw this whole idea of Masonic authority and jurisdiction out the window. And it was in this scenario that you started seeing other Grand Lodges also starting to spring up following uh, the Sedegast model. So. These are kind of the two things that were kind of bubbling around in Germany at the time that OTO took root. Now, we'll come back to this, but it's an important to kind of understand the background in which all this stuff was happening. As far as the story of OTO itself, um, I begin this, the, the story with a fellow by the name of Henry Klein. He was born in Germany, but as a young man, around the age of 21, he emigrated to England and started his own business there. And he also became a member of uh, Pilgrim Lodge, which was the German-speaking lodge operating in England. So they were chartered by the United Grand Lodge of England, but they had special permission to conduct their ceremonies in the German language, essentially for German expatriates who were living in, in the London area. He also uh, advanced far enough to become like the director of ceremonies in Pilgrim Lodge, which basically means you have a great deal of familiarity with the ritual. You're kind of the monitor. You're the one that makes sure that the rituals follow you know, according to the, the, the text of the, uh, the ritual. He was also acquainted with a fellow named Jeremiah Howe, who uh, was a high-ranking, very active Freemason, who also wrote this book called The Freemason's Manual, and it was one of the first books in England to kind of deal with the various high-degree rights that were springing up at that time. And the idea of the high-degree rights, I should say a few words about not assuming that... Uh, you all know what I'm talking about. As, uh, again, the, as I said earlier, the basic three degrees, you know, the first, second, and third, or um, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason are the fundamental degrees of all of Freemasonry. Uh, we, we call them the Blue Lodge here in the U.S. You know, in Europe, depending on where you're at, they may be called, you know, the, the St. John's degrees or the craft degrees or so on. Um, but then people like this so much and wanted more that other rituals began being offered that kind of you know follow this kind of model and even elaborated upon um, these degrees, saying, "Oh, these are commentaries or explanations of the mysteries you know referred to in those other degrees." And eventually, these rituals got collected up into a collection of degrees called a rite. So you have here you get things like the Scottish rite, the York rite, the rite of Memphis and Israel, and so on. And Jeremiah Howe was one of the first people to start talking about these upper degree rights in, in print. So it's significant because some of these upper degree rights wind up being integral to OTO's history, so that Henry Klein knew this fellow early on is kind of significant. And how, how they knew each other, we don't exactly know all the details, but I did dig up Henry Klein's 
a marriage certificate, and Jeremiah Howe and his daughter were the witnesses to Henry Quine's wedding. So you know, there was more than just passing acquaintances or I read this guy's book, I and mean, they actually knew each other. Klein was also a music publisher. He had a, had a music publishing business, and a lot of his first publications included sheet music written by composers who were also members of Pilgrim Lodge or um, the other lodges that he was involved in, such as uh, Wilhelm Gans, who was the grand organist for the United Grand Lodge of England, for example. Klein was also a composer, and he used you know, the... The, to his advantage, the fact that he ran a publishing company to also bring out his own compositions as well. And when the music publishing business started to kind of slow down in England, and it's, it slowed down not due to lack of interest, but due to, to kind of saturation. The market became so filled with composers and sheet music that one time it's estimated that in the late Victorian era that about a million different titles were in print. And that's a lot of music. And he shifted his business model to go into music reproducing devices. Um, and this is, again, to put this in context, we're talking the late Victorian age, the, the, you know, the 1890s. So there was, you know, there was no radio, there was no television, there, weren't, there was no phonographs, there was no Spotify, uh, no MP3 players. So if you wanted music in your home, you had a couple of options. You could either sing or perform it yourself, and most homes at this time had a piano in the house, or you had something that could make the music for you. And in fact, at this point, musical life became very prevalent in England because the middle class was actually thriving and were able to afford to go into London, and because of the new mass transit system, they were able to take trains and see concerts, afford these tickets that used to be just for rich people, and music became very important. And so did devices to make music in the home. So just as a few examples, uh, there's, uh, there's a picture here of a uh, forerunner to the modern player piano, and the way this worked was there, there were these big cardboard books that were kind of, the pages were taped end to end, and they were drawn into this piano, and the, the holes in this cardboard, you know, made the, the piano strike the appropriate notes, um, you know, which later just turned into simpler paper piano rolls and player pianos. Henry Klein also branched out of music reproducing devices, also into entertainment machines, such as the Pickwick, which was a forerunner of you know, the modern day pinball machines. Um, I don't know if you can call that modern day anymore, but essentially the way these worked is there was a little ball that uh, came out into this machine with a plunger. The ball would kind of shoot up to the top of this uh, glass-fronted machine and bounce between these pins, and when it came out the bottom, you were trying to catch it in a cup. And if you caught the ball in the cup, you'd get a prize, typically a cigar, and the cost of playing the game was equal to the cost of a cigar, so they can't, couldn't claim that you were gambling when you were playing the game. And then so he, he really kind of shifted into what, what really for the era was, you know, cutting edge technology for music and entertainment. So I tend to like to think of Henry Klein as kind of being a steampunk guitar center. <laughs> um, in addition to these other roles, he was also the secretary of the Wagner Popular Concert Society. So what, what they did was they got together a small troop of musicians, not the big orchestras you needed you know, a, a giant hall for, but you know, quartets or a piano soloist or you know, a small group of singers to perform some of Wagner's more popular pieces and to make them more accessible to you know, the public at large. So again, Klein was the secretary for this society, and he sold tickets to the concerts through his store. The singer at the second... Wagner popular concert was a fellow by the name of Theodore Royce, who had moved to England to pursue a career as a singer. Royce is a very interesting character, and he is essentially the the linchpin, the thing that holds, you know, the, he was a prime mover. I guess is probably a better word. He's he's the one that kind of motivated a lot of what happens in OTO um, and pushed it forward. So I'd like to say a little bit about him as well. Um, now that we've kind of brought him into the picture. So Theodore Royce 
was actually a spy <laughs> working for the Prussian government. And he came in to infiltrate the socialist movement in Germany, I'm oh, no, sorry, in, in London. Um, and the reason for this, and you know, Karl Marx's daughter, for instance, was actually living in London, and she was very involved in the socialist movement. But the socialist movement was also um, being um, kind of co-opted or, or fitting into a more radical anarchist movement that was also taking root in, in London. And what had happened was, after an assassination attempt on like the German prime minister, some some real you know uh, high-ranking official, the the anarchist movement was outlawed essentially, and so they had to take their operations, which included like publishing their anarchist literature outside of Germany and smuggle the literature in. And in that sense, you know, these the, these expatriate Germans now there are many of them in London and had kind of come into the socialist circle, and it was, so it's becoming more of an anarchist circle than a socialist circle at this point. And they were not only just smuggling in literature, which you know, would be pretty benign, but they were also actively smuggling explosives because the anarchist agenda was to blow shit up and overthrow the government. Um, and you know, one of the participants in this anarchist movement had even invented this thing called a scorpion sting or a scorpion's tail. It was a ring that had like a little needle on a plunger that you could just brush it against someone and it would you know, shoot out and inject a lethal amount of poison into the person that you brushed against and it can kill them instantly. And there was research of things, as the, the, these poison rings and these explosives that the government was concerned about being brought back into Germany. And they were essentially what in today's terminology we might call terrorists. Um, Royce, after he became involved, he uh, was instrumental in the arrest of one of its uh, main leaders, Johann Most. And once that happened, Royce conveniently kind of disappeared from the movement, and the rest of the leaders kind of started fighting against themselves. There were essentially two factions, one, one that liked Royce and was defending him and thought that the other guy who never liked Royce to begin with um, you know, was being unfair, and they just kind of, once Royce disappeared, the two of them just kind of went at it until the whole thing just kind of crumbled and fell apart. That's what Royce was doing in London, at least uh, a part of what he was doing. He was also a singer, so he was pursuing this career. You know, he had actually performed at uh, the debut performance of Wagner's Parsifal, for instance, in Beirut. He was part of the, the, the chorus for that. And he came to London, performed in various uh, musical productions around the city. And then, like Henry Klein, after a while he kind of left the performing end of the music business and got into the management end of the music business. And this is, again, this is something that Klein was also doing. Klein had, actually had talent management companies both in Berlin and London, and he was managing a lot of the foremost musicians of the era. Uh, particularly, he had actually a lot of students of Franz Liszt, uh, violinists and, and pianists. And it seems interesting that Royce, shortly after meeting Klein, would kind of wind up going into this business as well. And you wonder, did Klein kind of teach him the ropes? Um, and so you see this ad, for instance, of one of the groups that Royce was managing, the Harmonious Ladies, the most unique and novel combination of musical ladies ever seen or heard on the English stage. Eight, count them, eight charming young ladies in cavalier costumes singing a choice selection of the most melodious, unaccompanied glees, and so on. Um, not to belabor a point, but I, I think what, I, what struck me when I saw this was also the fact that shortly after Theodore Rice met Aleister Crowley, it's almost like Royce showed him the ropes of the business because all of a sudden Crowley, who had shown no interest whatsoever in music, is managing seven, count them seven, lovely ladies playing their violins <laughs> and playing, you know, the most melodious, uh, you know, waltzes and other pieces uh, for the public. <laughs> 